Glory to Jesus Christ. Father Bohdan Hladio here at St. John the Baptist Ukrainian Orthodox Church in Oshawa, Ontario. We're here in the manse and we are making the next of our instructional videos. This one about how prosvora are made. Prosvore are the altar breads used for the divine liturgy. And we normally in the church use five of them when we serve the liturgy. A little later we'll talk about the Byzantine practice of having just one big prosvora, but it's normal for all the churches to use five altar breads for each liturgy, of course, in commemoration of the multiplication of the five loaves by our Lord. And to make the prosvore, we have four ingredients, flour, yeast, water, and a little bit of salt. And we use in the Orthodox Church the raised bread, the yeast bread, whereas in the Roman Catholic Church and the Armenian Church they use the unleavened bread called azimi in Greek without any type of yeast. And in this bread we use, we call it prosimi, which has the yeast in it, so it's living bread. And we begin with the flour and we add to it some yeast. I'm using dry, quick action yeast, although you can use the regular yeast or even sourdough. sourdough. It's often um, uh, done with sourdough. Then a little bit of salt. And we'll mix that up. And once that's all nice and mixed, we use the water. But before we do that, I'm going to put some flour on the board so that when we put the dough onto the board, it doesn't stick. And as with any bread, a lot of how it ends up depends on the atmospheric conditions, the humidity, the air pressure, because it is a living thing and it is affected by the environment. So we begin by adding the water and we add enough water till we get a nice dough and we want a more firm dough because later on after it's risen and we've kneaded it the second time, we're going to be putting in the seals. And on the bread we have usually two or three different seals. The main one has the cross in the middle and in each quadrant of the cross uh, we have a couple of letters. IC, XC, and N-I-K-A. So looking at it from the top, on the left hand side it's I-C, Jesus, Jesus. On the left hand, X-C, Christos. And then on the bottom left, Ni, and the bottom right, Ka, which Nika in Greek means conquers. So on the seal, like we see on many of the crosses that we have, we have the words, Jesus Christ conquers. And so now we have the dough, which is a little bit too wet. So we're gonna be adding a lot of flour when we roll it out onto the board. The Greek word that is used for this bread, which is risen bread, yeast bread, is artos. And many of the Orthodox people, especially um, Ukrainians, Russians, will recognize the word artos as this particular special bread that we bless on 
Pascha, at the end of the liturgy, and then distribute to the people on Saturday, a bright week, or on Thomas Sunday. But the word artos actually, it just means bread, yeast bread. And the other word, as mentioned earlier, azimi, means unleavened bread. And so the Christians from the earliest times used the leavened bread for the Eucharist. And it was only centuries later that in the Roman Catholic Church and the Armenian Church, and then following the Roman Catholics when they broke off the various Protestant churches, that they began to use the unleavened bread. So that's a nice consistency, and we're going to start kneading it here on the board. And as far as the proportions, under normal circumstances, I would normally use about six cups of flour and then about a good teaspoon of the yeast, maybe a half to three quarters of a teaspoon of the salt, and then as much water as it takes to get the right consistency of the dough. And as mentioned earlier, that will depend often on atmospheric conditions, etc. It might be as little as two cups of water. It might be as much as three cups of water, usually somewhere in between. And so the important thing with bread is to knead it. Because the kneading breaks up the gluten. And it forms nice long chains that give it a nice consistency. As opposed to something like a nice French baguette or some other types of bread, we would like the bread to be very dense. And that's why it's important to have good flour more from what they call hard wheat. And while we knead the bread, normally we would say the Jesus prayer or some other type of prayer. Okay, and when the dough is ready, we put it in a pan. We'll cover it and let it rise for about an hour. And so we're back. The dough has had a chance to rise, and we will start making our prosvore. As I mentioned earlier, the prosvore are sealed. There's a seal that goes at the top. So this is the seal which is usually used for most of them, which is Isus Christos Nikai. You can see the inscription there. Here's a smaller version of exactly the same one. There's one for the Mother of God, and there are several forms of it. This one, as you can see, it in a stylized way spells Maria. And there's also this type, which is, again, very stylized. And you can see there's a triangle and the um, 
spear and the reed with the sponge on it. Sometimes you will see, th see this because there are, from the third prosvoida taken out nine, what they call the nine ranks, and they represent different ranks of saints that are commemorated. And also here we have a larger seal, which is the type used by, in, by Greeks, Byzantines, Antiochians in the Greek church, the Byzantine church, where they have one seal and one bread, but as you can see, there are five different sections, three with Isus Christos Nika, one for the mother of God, and one for the nine ranks of saints. And we'll make a, a bigger one with this, just to show how that works. So, once the dough has had a chance to rise, we take it out of the bowl, and again, we knead it. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. And the big thing that we want to do is to get all of the bubbles out of the dough because as we mentioned we want a nice dense loaf in each case. The prosvore, the altar breads, would often be made by someone, usually in a parish it would be a woman, called the prosvornetsa, the prosvora baker. In a monastery, the monk or nun, there would be one or several who this would be their obedience. That was their job to bake the prosvore for the monastery. And we know, for example, of the saints, Spiridon and, oh, the, his buddy, his name escapes me now from the KFK's monastery saints who are prosvoda bakers. And in the Greek tradition, it's very common that the women of the parish, or men, that they actually bake prosvore and bring them to church. And this is a reflection of the ancient Christian tradition, whereby people used to bring bread to the church. And then the deacons would choose of all the bread, the best, the finest, and that would be used for the Eucharist. And then everything that was left over would be distributed to the hungry. And that's why if many of you have been to places like Europe, and you see that it's still common in many places for poor people to beg outside of the churches, because when the liturgy was over, the deacons used to bring the leftover bread and give it to the people. Here we want to try to get all the air out so that we have a dense loaf. In the, uh, in the Russian tradition, there's a priest vestment you may have seen, which is like a rectangle that he wears over his right knee. And it's called in the Slavonic, they call that an epigonat. And then there's another vestment, which is like a diamond, trapezoidal shape, which is called a palica. And it's very confusing because what the Russians call the palica, the Greeks call the epigonation, and the epigonation is the original. The diamond-shaped one is the original vestment which derives from a court dress in the Roman Empire yet. But the one that the Russians call the epigonat, the triangular one, or I'm sorry, the rectangular one, um, it is said, 
that it derives from a bag. And you can, when you see the priest wearing it, you see it almost looks like that, like a, a little bag that you can, you know, put something in. Uh, that the priest would put the leftover bread after the liturgy into that bag and then go out and give it to the beggars after the liturgy. So I don't know how true that is, but it is a very interesting, um, very interesting explanation. And it does, again, reflect that ancient uh, practice whereby the bread, you know, after the liturgy, the bread that was left over would be given to the poor. And so, again, we want to get this nice and dense, so we want to get all of the bubbles out. And, you know, sometimes people ask, you know, who who bakes the prosvora? Can I bake the prosvora? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And in fact, uh, it is a very good and blessed thing because when we pray in the liturgy, you know, you remember that we pray for those um, for the gifts here offered. We also pray for those who have offered the gifts, right? And in one sense. That could be a person who makes a donation, and then with that donation, um, flour and wine and yeast are purchased. And so in that sense, you know, the person has offered the gifts. But in a more direct way, you know, if somebody actually offers an altar bread, that's even a more direct way in which, you know, you're praying for that person who has offered that which is going to be offered. So we have this nice and rolled out, and we will now start cutting the bottom sections because every prosvora has two parts. There's a bottom and there's a top. And the reason we do this, the symbolism is that Christ had two natures. He was both divine and human. And so the prosvora has a top part and a bottom part. And so we make them in two parts. Also, as mentioned, I'm going to be making a Greek style one just so you can see it. So this will be the bottom for that Greek style prosphora. Okay, as you see, that's much bigger than the other. Now, we're going to roll this out a little bit thinner and try to make sure that it's pretty well uniform in thickness and get rid of any little bubbles we might see. And then we'll make the top portion. These are the portions that have the seal on them. And so Okay, and then for the larger one, we will do this. And then we'll start making the bottoms for some smaller ones. Because besides the five that we use for the liturgy itself, there's a custom that people can offer these smaller prosphore. And as mentioned earlier in the Greek tradition, you know, the families themselves might offer a prosphore, you know, that they might bake 
or that they might have purchased, purchased at a bakery, and they would offer that, whereas in Ukraine, Poland, Russia, there's a custom whereby whoever bakes the prosfore bakes little ones like this, and then when people come to church, they can offer their list of names along with one of these prosfore. And then what the priest would do would be to take little particles out of each prosfore. The sacristan or the subdeacon would give him the little prosfore with a list of names for the living, for the dead, for health. And he would take out particles and put them on the discos and those, that's the way those people would be commemorated. And then after that, the little prosvora would be given back to the people who offered it. And so that's, if you would like to see that, you can look at our little film on the proscomedia. And there's a demonstration of how that is done. So here we're going to start with the Jesus Christos Nika, and we need three of these. One for the lamb, which is that part of the prosvora, which is cut out and then sacrificed. It's used for Holy Communion. The other two, one is for the prosvora, for the commemoration of the living. And the other one is for the commemoration of the dead. Next, we'll do this one for the nine ranks of saints. And of course, for the mother of God. And so what we do is we take a little bit of water and we brush the tops of those bottom portions and this helps the top and the bottom to stick together. Okay, and then we'll do this larger one. Okay, now one of the things that's very important is to, again, we're always trying to get any bubbles that might be there out. So we prick the top of the prosvora with a sharp object. It might be a type of a thicker needle or pin. This, of course, is a wooden skewer. And we want to make sure that especially that no air gathers under the seal, that the seal is very, very tightly engraved into the bread itself. Because when the lamb is taken out, we would like to have a nice, dense cube. So here's the the prosphora for the Mother of God. And with the larger one, we do the same thing. We just do besides around the actual center 
we go also around the edges. In our tradition, we normally would use five. In the Greek tradition, they, if they had five, they would, they would use five, but they would be bigger ones, bigger than this actually. But you'll often see that the priest will only use one. And uh, in some traditions, specifically on Mount Athos, uh, they would say that you always have to have at least two because the, the lamb, the portion that's consecrated, has to be from its own loaf. And then the other loaf you could take everything else from. And there's that famous story of St. Paisius of the Holy Mountain when he was going somewhere for a liturgy and he had two prosvoter with him for the liturgy and he met a bear on the way. <laughs> and so he gave the bear one of the prosvoter and the bear let him go and he went to have the liturgy. So one would assume that that liturgy took place only on one prosvoter. And so we continue to try to get the dough rolled out without any bubbles. And we just continue. And if you're ever interested in making prosvore, there are lots of resources available. There's actually a, a website called prosvora.org, which is very interesting. So here, we'll make the tops for the smaller ones. And again, we just wet the tops a little bit. This board, actually everything that's here, other than the knife, is used only for making prosvore. So that's the ideal. If you can afford it, if you have the time and the space and the money, that whatever you use is used only to make the prosvore. And as I mentioned earlier, when I'm making prosvore, I'm usually not talking about making prosvore, but usually you say the Jesus prayer or something like that so that the altar breads are made with prayer, like everything. Because prayer shouldn't be something we do, it should be something we are. And if we are prayerfully inclined, if our heart is, you know, prayerfully directed, then everything we do, whether we're changing a diaper, or baking prosvore, or fixing the brakes in the car, whatever we do, it becomes prayer. Okay, so we're gonna make two more of the larger ones. And I'll make a couple of smaller ones. Yeah. 
And I used a smaller, a smaller amount of flour, a smaller recipe today, just in the interest of time. But if I did the normal, like six cups, basically both of these trays would be full of prosphore of various sizes. Okay, and as soon as I'm done with this, we'll finish it off. And one of the very beautiful things about the liturgy in general, the Eucharist in particular, is the fact that we use bread and wine. You know, you think if Jesus wanted to give us something that we would share as a meal in his memory, I mean, what would be better? The bread and the wine are both things that only humans have. No other animals bake bread or make wine. So they are quintessentially human foods. They both require yeast. And as we know, yeast is a living thing. So that it's not just, you know, some dead matter that we eat, but it is incumbent upon these little living creatures to make the carbon dioxide that lets the bread raise and lets the wine ferment. So this is a very, very meaningful thing. We often don't think about it because nowadays we don't think about where we get our food much at all. But the fact that these, you know, this food and drink, the bread and wine, had deeply meaningful connotations in a spiritual and religious sense for the Jews. And building upon that, they have deeply meaning spiritual connotations for us as Christians. Um, when I was a little boy, if a piece of bread fell on the floor, we were taught you had to pick it up, kiss it, and then eat it. Bread was holy. And nowadays, unfortunately, some might think fortunately, um, we really don't you know, we don't appreciate bread unless perhaps we are very hoity-toity kind of people who make sure that we get our artisan bread for a relatively heavy price because we are bread connoisseurs. But for most of human history, I mean, bread, that was the basic food. And for our grandmothers in my generation, great-grandmothers for those who are younger, in their generation, basically, no matter where you lived in the world, if you were a normal person, not somebody who's really well off, you know, the, the mother's job, the wife's job would be to get up, you know, before the dawn, go to the well, which might be several hundred meters, maybe a kilometer away, get water, grind grain to make flour, make that flour into bread, so that when your family woke up, 
you would you would have something for them to eat and that's why I find it very very amusing when people nowadays say oh you know father we're too busy to come to church you know we have so much you know that we have to do and you know in the old country like they didn't have anything better to do you know they you know they basically I don't know what they think they sat around and watched Oprah or something I don't know but you know the, the people worked very hard no matter where and I think of the people here for example if you go to Western Canada we we're just talking about this with friends where you have you know let's say five miles to the church and people would go there sometimes more than five miles you know when they had all those farms and all the quarter sections and people would go get up in the morning hitch up the horses, then go there with a horse and buggy, be there for liturgy, which was usually longer rather than shorter, and that was just what they did. It's a very beautiful thing, you know, that, that dedication that people had. And so now, with all our labor-saving devices, being able to get water out of the tap and flour out of the bag, we really have to consider, number one, how grateful we should be to God that we have all these labor-saving devices, and secondly, that all these labor-saving devices and opportunity, that if they're saving us time, that that might be time that we might devote maybe at least part ways to God. Anyway, we're going to um, poke the holes in these and then put them in the oven. O Lord, Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me, the sinner. Hospode, Isuse Christe, Sine Bože, pomilimene Krishnoho. Kyrie, Isu Christe, Iethiu, eleison me tonamartolon. Lord, Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me, the sinner. Hospode, Isuse Christe, Sine Bože, pomilimene Krishnoho. Kyrie, Isu Christe, Iethiu, eleison me tonamartolon. Lord, Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me, the sinner. Hospode, Isuse Christe, Sine Bože, pomili mene hrišnoho. Kyrie, Iethiu, eleison me tonamartolon. Lord, Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me, the sinner. Lord, Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me, the sinner. Lord. Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me, the sinner. Amen. And now, to the oven. And we placed them in the oven, 325 degrees Fahrenheit, for about 25 minutes, but have to check on them when the bottoms are getting uh, a nice golden crust on them and the top just just begins to turn a little bit golden that's when we pull them out and so 25 minutes to a half hour later we pulled the crosswater out of the oven and you see how on the bottom we have a nice golden color the crosswater that has the Isus Christos Nyuka that seal these will be used either for the lamb, which becomes the body of our Lord, or for the commemoration of the living or of the dead. The prosphora for the mother of God. This is where that triangular portion will be taken out in commemoration of the mother of God. The prosphora for the ranks of the saints. Each one of these little triangles will be excised and put on the discourse in commemoration of the various ranks of the saints and as you see this large one we made the Greek style or Byzantine style just to show you that it has five the three of Jesus Christos Nika as well as for the mother of God and for the ranks of the saints five different seals incorporated into that one seal there here we have the smaller ones which 
will be used for commemorations by the people. If anyone gives a list of names to be commemorated for the living, for the dead, for health, they would, the priest would take particles, put them on the discos in the proper place, and then the rosvora would be given back to the people that they can take home. They can divide it among the family and eat it. And we have the film of the Prospermedia, which you can look at, which will show you how all of this is done during the liturgy of preparation, the Proscomedia, which takes place before the liturgy begins. Thank you for watching, and please do take a look at the other demonstration videos that we've prepared about those portions of the Divine Liturgy, which the faithful normally don't see. And if you would feel called to make Prosphoric, please feel free to talk to your priest about it. And as mentioned earlier, you can find lots of information uh, on the internet about how to make prosphora, different recipes, etc. But the most important thing is talk to your priest, get a blessing, and then if he blesses you to do so, it's a very wonderful way of serving your parish. May God bless and keep you. Spasivas Pospuri.